Hi everybody, I'm Francesca Maxime and this is Wise Girl. It is November 15th, 2018, and I am really pleased to have Dr. Vincent Felitti with me today. Many of you may know him, some of you may not. He is the one who championed the Kaiser Permanente study on adverse childhood experiences that really dig into the roots of traumatic events in people's lives and could be very transformative for clinicians of all kinds, for lay people to really just have a general understanding of their own history and how to be able to move forward from what I like to call a life that often can be successful in many respects from surviving to one of actually moving through uh, transformatively to thriving. So Dr. Felitti, thank you so much for joining us today. We really appreciate it. You're quite welcome. I'm delighted to be here. Um, for people who don't know, um, this is one of those studies that I think was groundbreaking on so many levels, mainly because it was uh, so wide and large and, and, and backed up. There's, there's, there's no mistaking that its validity. Um, I guess I'll ask you from the very beginning to just talk about the fact that you were recognizing that there were people who were very obese that you were studying, and then you realized that they were relapsing for reasons that didn't have to do with what you were teaching them in terms of diet and weight management. And so that's how this sort of came about, if I'm not mistaken. So can you start there? Yeah, the obesity program um, was where this all began because of multiple counterintuitive observations that we were making. Ultimately coming to realize that for most of the people we were seeing, and this was a very heavy group, um, for most of the people we were seeing, obesity was not merely the problem. It was also, also, their unconscious solution to problems that we knew nothing about. Quick example, um, in the early days of the program, before we had figured all of this out, I was going through a woman's life with her, what did you weigh when you were born, in kindergarten, and sixth grade, when you began to menstruate, etc. And if you don't remember, were you the skinniest kid in the class, the fattest, ordinary size, and so on. We get to age 23, and she tells me that at 23 she was raped, and in the year subsequent gained 105 pounds. And then she looks down at the carpet and mutters to herself, overweight is overlooked, and that's the way I need to be. Wow. And, isn't and then about two weeks later, a somewhat similar case uh, whom we had taken from 309 to 132 pounds in 51 weeks, and who stayed at that weight for a couple of weeks, and then in one three-week period regained 37 pounds, which I had not conceived as being physiologically possible before that. And I asked, you know, what's going on? I think I'm sleep eating, she said. What do you mean? She explains to me that as a little girl, she had been a sleepwalker. Um, and now she lives alone. When she goes to bed at night, everything is clean and put away in the kitchen. She wakes up in the morning, pots and dishes are dirty, boxes and cans are open. Somebody's obviously been cooking and eating there. She's the only person there, but she has no recollection of this. Okay, I never heard of it before, but it has a certain force of logic, but why now? And after demurring several times that she didn't know why, she says to me, well, actually, there was this man at work. He said to me, hey, Patty, you look pretty good. You lost all that weight. How about you and me making it every week? And that was the day the sleep eating began. And I remember thinking, well, it's a pretty crummy proposition, but I mean, this is 1986, it is Southern California, it's kind of an extreme response. Why the extreme response? <clears throat> Pursuing that in maybe seven or eight minutes, she starts telling me about her grandfather having vaginal intercourse with her repeatedly starting at age 10 when she began to put on weight. 
And that was what triggered me to start inquiring routinely in the obesity program about childhood sexual abuse. And it was really a staggering experience because every other person I was asking was acknowledging such a history. It took me several months to convince myself that this was real, but that nobody wanted to know. That was really what began the ACE study. As we went down that path, we learned about other forms of abuse, about growing up in massively dysfunctional households, etc. I presented this at a national obesity meeting in Atlanta in 1990. It was attacked by the audience. Some guy gets up and under the guise of asking a question makes the pronouncement. You really need to understand, Dr. Felitti, that people who are more familiar with these matters, like obviously they, recognize that these statements by patients are fabrications to provide a cover explanation for failed lives. And I remember thinking, yeah, right, <laughs> people are making false claims of incest for social aggrandizement. Um, wow. So that evening, there was a dinner meeting for the speakers, and seated next to me was someone from the CDC. And he said, look, you know, if what you're saying is true, it's got enormous importance for the country as well as the practice of medicine, but nobody's going to believe your 286 cases no matter how well you study them, what we need is a large epidemiologically sound study with thousands of people in it and from a general population, not from some group that you've somehow accumulated. Okay, yeah, we could do that because I had a department back home with a very unusual division uh, where we supplied uncommonly comprehensive medical evaluation to 58,000 adults a year in one setting. It was the biggest operation of its type, certainly in the Western world, perhaps anywhere. So that was the beginning of the ACE study. He invited me to the CDC. They came out to visit me to look at the site and so on. And uh, we spent the next two years planning how we were going to do this. And when we submitted the protocol to the Institutional Review Board, uh, turned down flat. Otherwise sensible people told us, you know, you, you can't ask patients questions like that. You're going to make people decompensate, maybe occasionally become suicidal. You know, you, you can't use that questionnaire. And we, we battled literally nine months before we got agreement on that. Uh, and then uh, we asked 26,000 consecutive adults coming through for comprehensive evaluation if they would help us. And uh, 17,500 agreed. And we carried out detailed comprehensive evaluation of them comparing current health status at average age 57 to what had happened to them in, children, in childhood and adolescence. And then we followed them for the next 20 years to see what was going to happen in the future. That was the basis for the ACE study. And it, and it really is so amazing because of the way in which it came about. And the first thing you said, oh, this is real, but nobody wanted to know. Yeah. And that then you were met also with the fabrication allegation, and then you were met with, well, but you can't ask people these things for whatever reasons. And I, I just really want to emphasize again, like from a mindfulness perspective, um, from the perspective of um, sort of ancient wisdom teachings that I sit from also sometimes and for whom, um, you know, my audience is, is familiar oftentimes the whole basis of things is wrong view or ignorance or delusion. And so then this kind of denial or this kind of ignorance or this kind of um, not being willing to look would very much be in keeping with uh, what is keeping us from moving through from a place of contraction to a place of relaxation, well-being and, um, and thriving and, 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 and really um, living, living a life with, um, with your life force intact from the bottom up and not just uh, sort of trying to, to live your life in a way that 
that sort of can look glossy on the outside, but is is maybe not so not so pleasant inside, and then has you know consequent side effects, whether it's the eating or perhaps alcohol or perhaps promis promiscuity or perhaps other kinds of gambling or spending behaviors that get people into trouble and, and things like that. So um, say, saying that, um, the study suggests that maltreatment and household dysfunction in childhood contribute to health problems even decades later, as you said, and that a majority of the people had experienced um, in your original um, piece, childhood sexual abuse, which I think is so uh, incredible that the the measures that you're asking, because this is a questionnaire and there's a longer version and a shorter version now, but that this is a questionnaire that asks about sexual abuse, emotional abuse, physical neglect, emotional neglect, exposure to domestic violence, household substance abuse, household mental illness, parental separation or divorce, and an incarcerated family member, whether or not your um, caregivers are in, in prison or, or behind bars. And that the more of these that people have, the more prone essentially they are to not having well-being and to having sustained problems later in their life through their lifespan and even a truncated life by as much yeah. as... Oh, markedly. Yeah, then we'll talk about that. Well, we found, we, we were dealing with literally mountains of information. Um, and... Um, we needed some way of simplifying things, so we created a so-called ACE score, uh, which ranged from zero to 10. Uh, we simply picked the 10 most common categories of abuse that we were seeing in the WAIT program. And this was a very interesting population because it was a very clearly middle-class population. 74% had been to college, everybody had a job, everybody had high-end medical insurance, etc. Half women, half men, 80% white, including Hispanic, 10% black, 10% Asian, um, average age 57, and so on. And uh, so we counted the number of categories, not events, but categories of experience that they had had and uh, that was the A score, and that could range from zero to 10. And uh, some of the startling things, 28% of the women acknowledged a history of contact childhood sexual abuse, as did 16% of the men, um, that sort of thing. And we found that anyone with an A score of six or more categories, had a shortening of life expectancy by 19.7 years, basically a 20-year shortening of life at A score six or higher. Which is which is so dramatic and and oh, so, yeah. and and so incredible because it um the the what the term is comorbidity or con you know that a lot of things are happening simultaneously right so if you're somebody who eats too much um to manage your life as your example did with the woman um then she'll you know that's to protect herself from being uh looked upon as a um, object of sexual desire since she was uh, her boundaries were invaded uh, as a child and then going forward um then has diabetes or other issues, uh, joints and, and things like that, um, that will happen that then create this early death. Yes. Um, it says here also that um, I think that, to explain the numbers for the uh, IV drug users, because I think they're phenomenal. Um, at eight, I believe with A score six or higher, the likelihood of that particular individual becoming uh, an injection drug user, an IV drug user, was 4,600% greater than the likelihood of an A-score zero individual becoming an IV drug user. Which I just think is so um, so incredible because again, as we're moving from, um, I was just uh, you know I interviewed Dick Schwartz um, for for Internal Family Systems um, Originator um, for for this and and was listening to a conversation he was having with someone recently about the pathologization of folks with the DSM and you know different ways in which we 
think about people in terms of pathology in a medical model, whereas more of the Eastern philosophy of the mindfulness piece really looks at the inner well-being and wholeness of the person that is inherent, the inner dignity that is there, and then um, using these techniques of mindfulness to kind of recover that and see through and cut through um, you know, our real essence and our interdependence in that way. And, you know, people heal in relationship, but they're also injured in relationship, which is what you're talking about. And so I want to move forward with this to talk a little bit about resilience, because I think there's sometimes a neoliberal thought about, as you were indicating with the statements that these people made to you, that people should be able to just either manage or they're making things up because they weren't successful or whatever it is. So how can this study even today, be applied in ways that are useful to perhaps move the needle on those kinds of issues? Well, we, we can say a few things about resilience. It's real. It's heavily dependent on having at least one person early in your life feel that you were really important to them and convincingly transmit that information to you but it's partial, and most people don't understand that. People assess resilience in a fragmentary way, by income, by social success, by academic success, etc. No one looks at biomedical outcomes. The best example of this is a book that anyone can look at on Amazon and sample. It's called Judging Me, written by a United States federal judge, a woman who describes having been molested repeatedly by her father as a little girl, worse yet, taking her into saloons at night and selling her to strangers for sex. Somehow she does not commit suicide. She does not become a mass murderer. She graduates high school. She gets into college. She graduates college. She gets into law school, graduates law school, becomes a United States federal judge. It would be very easy to say, isn't it wonderful that little girl with that terrible history has been so resilient. When we look at biomedical outcomes, the missing piece in the assessment of resilience, she has had five different kinds of cancer in her life, not relapses, but different kinds of cancer, and has two autoimmune diseases, lupus and multiple sclerosis. We looked at 21 different autoimmune diseases and found that there was a dose relationship of A score to likelihood of outcome of one of 16 out of those 21 autoimmune diseases. So, so these were extraordinary things that we found. The question, of course, is, well, how, how does that come about? I mean, how does what happens to a little girl you know, affect how many cancers she, you know, initially our thought was, well, yeah, you smoke two, three packs a day to feel better, of course. And that's true, but that's just a very limited portion of the explanation. The real piece has actually been known for several decades, but the parts were not put together. We all know that if you get an organ transplant, you have to be on immunosuppression medications for the rest of your life so you don't reject the organ. Some people will correctly have heard that one of the side effects of being on lifetime immunosuppression is an increased risk of cancer. Well, okay, you know, if I'm gonna die next week without that kidney, um, give me the kidney and I'll worry about, you know, maybe getting cancer 15 years from now. But how does that work? Well, the piece that most people don't know is that we're all forming low levels of cancer cells every day from a huge variety of organs in our bodies. Our immune systems recognize them, destroy them, and we never know the difference. So getting cancer means either that something has markedly increased the amount of production of these cells, 
or that something has suppressed the ability of our immune systems to destroy those cells as they are formed normally at a low level every day. So this is really an extraordinary insight uh, and helps explain some of the stranger findings that we had. I love what you're saying, and it's actually, you know, I've mentioned my mother's a physician, and she's also, she's an internist um, and um, has her master's in public health, and explained that to me, that we all have cancer cells, and it's a question of whether or not they sort of turn on or not, if you will, um, based on whatever our stress levels are, or our experiences are, or whatever it is, um, sort of intuitively, you know, linking that, and I think that, you um, the bio uh, piece in terms of it being the marker of success or failure for resilience, so to speak, as opposed to the, hey, she's a judge, hey, she's successful, hey, she makes money or whatever it is, sure, sure. Uh, is, is a huge different piece. And I think it also points to the way in which culturally, which very much does shape what we talk about, how we talk about it, the language we use, whether or not we quote unquote, go there or not, is very much rooted in you know, these ideas of shame or pathology or blame or, you know, there's something wrong with you if you can't figure it out on your own. We should all each as an individual be able to do this sure. on our own. And I think what you're speaking to is, is that we're all products of our environment. Yeah. And yeah, our history. Certainly so. And, you know, and our history and, and our genetics also. Um, so can we expand this then to, to talk a little bit about how that affects, for example, I know Dr. Nadine Burke-Harris has done a lot of work in this sphere. Can we talk a little bit about oppressed, marginalized communities, communities that have had, um, you know, different kinds of uh, experiences perhaps that are traumatic in a different way than um, perhaps the incident um, that very much is present in ACE studies for you know the kinds of more affluent uh, folks that you had in your original study. But how does this apply to folks in in more oppressed communities who've experienced this kind of trauma? Well, in one way, I can't answer your question because we studied a very biased sample, a clearly middle class, predominantly white, you know, reasonably successful population. However, I don't think anyone would, I mean, and things were just amazingly bad there. They sure don't get better if you're part of an oppressed minority, if you're living on the street penniless, if you've just, you know, immigrated into the country from some war-torn part of the earth, etc. But we haven't studied those. Other people are beginning to do that now. Uh, pieces of the ACE study have been replicated in prison systems and so on. And, you know, reasonably enough, the ACE scores there are extremely high. So this information will come from different populations. But where the World Health Organization uh, has been using now for a number of years our ACE study questionnaire with 20 European nations annually, and they're essentially finding the same general findings that we have in the United States, that these are common, they are unrecognized, they are unspoken, uh, they are profoundly damaging given time, etc. Uh, so uh, the WHO is doing this, as I say, annually with 20 European nations and eight Asian countries, including China. Yeah, that's, um, it's, it's really incredible to think about the fact that, um, of course, things on the surface can appear to be a certain way, but people's histories, um, they, the, the, you know, as, as Dr. Bessel van der Kook talks about, the body keeps the score. And so the trauma um, yes. you know, uh, evinces itself either behaviorally or somatically in some yeah. form to different degrees with, with different people. Um, Let's go back to this question of like, you're not supposed to talk about it. And one of the questions that I had from someone was um, along the lines of why aren't more doctors, why aren't more pediatricians using the ACE scores, uh, the, you know, the sheet, the 10 questionnaire, um, why aren't they using it more? To screen about- yeah, Oh yeah, I, I understand the question. Yeah. Uh, 
we, we have not studied the answer, but, but from what I have seen over the years in this regard, I would say that it all starts with the fact that we've all been taught as children that nice people don't talk about certain things and my God, surely don't ask questions about them. That that's, that that's the beginning. There are many other factors coming in. Time, okay, and indeed the way medical practice is ordinarily structured, time is a very limiting kind of factor. I was very lucky at Kaiser Permanente that in this department that I had, we were able to restructure the way things were done radically, altering the length of time that it took to get them, and hence the cost that it took to get them, etc. So, so that's another issue. Uh, I've had many colleagues say to me, if I wanted to be a damn shrink, I'd have been a shrink. I'm a pediatric gastroenterologist or what have you. Uh, it's a lot easier to look at all of medicine as though everything is a biomedical disease. Uh, it's a lot easier to treat someone with a broken ankle than someone who has had headaches for 20 years. That, that kind of thing. Uh, and the fact that to get this information, you really need an in-depth history from people and we are used to getting that in the limited number of instances when we do get it by face-to-face -face questioning. That's unaffordable. It's very time consuming. I mean, to get a really detailed medical history from somebody might take an hour. So that's, that's a lot of money right there. Then you have to make a legible record of that so the information isn't lost. And it's fraught with interpersonal difficulties. Well, you know, this doctor's too young to understand. I don't want to, this one's too old. I don't want to talk with them about this. I'd rather talk with the lady doctor. You know, I'd rather talk with somebody who's Polish or Vietnamese like me that would understand me, that kind of thing. So, so we found on a huge scale um, that a really comprehensive medical history is best obtained by an inert mechanism initially, step one. And for us, that was a 10-page paper questionnaire filled out at home, not on a clipboard in the waiting room, filled out at home. And then we fed that into a digital scanner, picked up all the yes answers, got a nice two, sometimes three-page printout of all of the yes answers. We knew ahead of time where we had to go further with this person. And our approach in the exam room was typically, I see on the questionnaire that. Can you tell me how that's affected you later in your life? And we listened, period. We did one other thing that took us some time to realize that we implicitly accepted that person who had just told us the darkest secret of their life, typically for the first time. And then several years into this, a mathematician from the University of California came by and this guy had a startup data mining company and he offered to do free a 135,000 patient study, two and a half years throughput for our department, to see whether the addition of these childhood trauma questions, the ACE questions to our general medical questionnaire, had any discernible impact. And incredibly, he found that this triggered a 35% reduction in doctor office visits the next year compared to the year before and an 11% reduction in emergency room visits. Now, in the big organization, that has multi-billion dollar implications. As a result, 21 state legislatures have passed legislation designed to support the routine collection of this information in primary care. It's yet to be determined whether, you know, that's a realistic approach, whether it's going to work. But the fact of their interest is inescapable. And the reason they're so interested is, I mean, knocking a third off the state Medicaid budget. Wow. 
<laughs> you know, what are we going to do with the several thousand dollars we've just surplus? Money talks. Yeah. Money talks for sure. But I think what you said just then was that a doctors and anyone can be uncomfortable asking these questions because they don't really know how to hold it. Yes. They don't really know how to hold the answers. Perhaps they have unresolved trauma in their own life and they feel as though discussing it isn't only impolite, but perhaps it's something that makes them feel uncomfortable because they have to reflect on their own situation when they otherwise have not wanted to. And then also that you took time to listen and how the system isn't set up right now to enable people to do that because they are always in this loop of when's the next patient every 10 or 15 minutes coming into the door and that that presence that a physician used to be was not one of the things that's valued so much in this model of um, maximization of profit um, either by the medical centers or by you know, what insurance companies require. And so I guess I just want to really call out quite plainly what I think I hear you saying, which is that the system is sort of set up to be at odds in many ways with people's well-being. Yeah. It certainly is not set up to be anywhere near as efficient as it could be. No question about that. Right. And, and, and when I here, you know, my main interest in trauma and in um, understanding your study and understanding its applications has to do with sort of these fundamental tenets that I think are true. I mean, if you talk about uh, physiologically, biophysiologically, you talk about homeostasis, you talk about an actual physical well-being, and we're not talking about um, you know, adaptations that are uh, workarounds or, or other kinds of um, mutations, perhaps, or th things like that. We're talking about general well-being for the majority of the population across countries, across, um, across ages. Um, that, when, that when a being is born, is there not something innately well about them, right? Um, and that also, when you were speaking about the piece of what happens early on in life, that speaks to what we would call the attachment piece about the way in which our early caregivers, whether it's our parents or someone else in our lives that's significant, gives us a feeling of feeling safe, <coughs> safe seen and yes. soothed, and that we feel validated emotionally and that we have some kind of ability to then connect with another and that that forms as a basis of our resilience, right? So we yeah. have this sort of innate well-being, if you will, and then we have this piece of hopefully we get a good caregiver response. But then as we endure trauma, traumatic events, different things that happen externally to us that are impactful in ways that um, are negative, that they don't just go away on their own. There was a piece here that said something like, um, you know, denial is, is, it's, you know, that resilience is something that you can't really deny. It doesn't, it doesn't go, the trauma doesn't go away on its own. People say time heals all wounds, but that it doesn't really do that. And so moving forward with your piece about the implications for children, particularly, for the medical community, particularly, and even for people at home listening to this who are not in either one of those fields, what are some of the takeaways for each of those populations in terms of traumatic events that may happen in their lives? Would you invite them to take their study on their own? Would you invite them to do it and bring it to their doctor or have their kids screened for it? Well, anyone who, who wants to learn more about this can simply look on the internet using the search term ACE study, ACE study, excuse me, ACE study, or on YouTube. And the amount of information that's readily available is, you know, really quite, quite surprising. We should say something about the mechanism by which one converts life experience in childhood into disease as an adult a half century later. And, and there are three pathways there. One is through the use of various coping mechanisms to feel better eat to feel better, and then discovering that obesity can be protective, okay? Uh, a male example of protection 
in the early days of the WAIT program, we had two men who were guards of the state penitentiary downtown. One lost 100, the other lost 150 pounds. They made no bones about it. They were no longer comfortable walking into the cell blocks normal size. They felt a lot better going and looking big as a refrigerator. You think of our expression, throwing your weight around. Oh, hmm. <laughs> Maybe that means something. Right. Um, so eating is a coping mechanism. You know, sit down, have something to eat, you'll feel better. It works. Uh, it's not curative, but it helps. Uh, alcohol, sit down, have a drink, relax. Sit down, have a smoke, relax, etc. cetera. Um, buying antidepressants on the street, but not knowing that they're antidepressants. It's called crystal meth. I mean, everybody knows about the dangers of crystal meth. Nobody knows that methamphetamine was the first really successful prescription antidepressant introduced for sale in the United States in 1940, holding that position for about the next 10 or 15 years. No, but isn't it dangerous? Well, if you don't understand dose, pretty much any medicine could be dangerous. You know, double your digitalis, you have a good chance of being dead in 10 days. Uh, that that sort of thing. So so through various coping mechanisms. Other ones, promiscuity. Well, somebody's going to love me, and if it's not this one, well, you know, surely the one after might, etc. So that's one big category. Another big category is a vastly more complex one, namely the effect of chronic hyperstimulation of certain areas of the brain the process involved in so-called traumatic stress. Chronic hyperstimulation of certain areas of the brain causes the release of pro-inflammatory chemicals that inflame the lining of blood vessels, causing them to have a magnetic effect, pulling cholesterol out as it flows by, ultimately obstructing the vessel, etc. a big issue in heart disease, for instance. Um, suppression of the immune system, um, minimizing the, the destruction of those cancer cells that are normally produced in all of us every day, allowing them to multiply. So that's a big and complex second category. And there's a third category that we didn't study, and that has to do with epigenetic effects. Uh, the word barely existed in the early 90s when we were uh, putting the study together. Uh, the field has grown explosively since then, and there's no question that you're going to be hearing a lot about epigenetic effects in the next several years. Epigenetic effects differ from mutations. A mutation is a structural change in the gene. An epigenetic effect refers to the effect that environmental stimuli can have on the function of the gene, essentially acting like an on-off switch on the gene. The structure of the gene is undamaged, an on-off gene essentially is put onto it. And those can have very complex effects, and we're only beginning to understand those, not only that, but they can also be transmitted intergenerationally. So that what happens to a pregnant woman can produce epigenetic effects on the infant who is in utero that will then carry out in that child's life. So these are the three big categories that we understand at the present time. Um, there may well be more yet to be discovered, but. And, and those are all so profound in their own ways, because how many books are there out there for quote unquote self-help when it comes to whether it's finding love or quitting drinking or, or, or any of the things you mentioned in terms of a, a, a sort of um, a crutch behavior, if you will, and perhaps a compulsive or addictive, addictive behavior, but that it's really serving a need as, um, as I was saying, Dr. Marshall Rosenberg of Nonviolent Communications um, describes, you know, what need is it serving? How is this, when you're raging at someone or when you're shutting down, even behaviorally, it may not be 
a um, addictive substance that you're putting in your ingesting, so to speak, but the behavior is also uh, affecting those um, sure. dopamine and, and cortisol and, and inflammatory effects within you. Um, and then how does that play out in your interrelationships and how can that be a form for healing, kind of like, uh, if you will, uh, redoing in the present day, perhaps, what was not done well earlier, but it's the only way you know how to be in much the same way that people are looking for relief when from their trauma with a cigarette or with alcohol or with, or with whatever kind of behavior. Sure. Um, and, and so the epigenetic piece, I think, is interesting from that ancestral trauma standpoint. If you look at the history of racism in this country, if you took, look at... Um, uh, there's a complex trauma training that I'm involved in now on indigenous um, uh, and aboriginal trauma yeah. um, that is offered by Shirley Turcott um, from Canada. And these, these are other ways of looking at the ways in which that which is carried forward can be turned on or off depending on circumstance. Um, and, and telomerically, like the, the, the phrase of the telomeres, if you're interested in you know, that, you know, you know more about it than, than me, but that, that they can either be hurt or helped based on our, our circumstance. Maybe you want to just mention that as part of, the, part of this part of the conversation. The, that's not something that we studied as part of the A study, and I, I really have nothing in particular to, you to know, say about it. But say about but it is something that's being studied now, as you were saying, oh, yeah. forward. Yeah. yeah. So I was, yeah. yeah. So not, certainly not something you have to comment on from, from, from your own study, but just the fact that there are more studies coming out about that. And then also about memory and our limbic memory. Or I know limbic is, is not really a, a word people use as much anymore, but our emotional memory, for lack of a better word, and how influenced that is by trauma and who, how we get stuck in trauma time that we end up sort of being stuck in the place that we were when we were five or seven as that woman was or however mm. old she was. And then how do we move through that? Because all of this to me is helpful if we can use it to understand how we're then going to inform moving through and beyond. The most useful thing that we discovered is the great power of helping people discover what they know at some deep level already and bringing it up into their consciousness which opens the possibility of dealing with it differently in the obesity program and it was a terrific program i mean we were using a then new uh, um, approach to treatment obesity uh, treating obesity called supplemented absolute fasting people ceased eating all food, just drinking water for very prolonged periods of time. Now, if that's all you do, as the Irish hunger strikers illustrated some years ago, you die in about six weeks. And you'll die because of major potassium and magnesium deficiency, setting off lethal cardiac rhythm disturbances. Okay, well, that's easy to fix. You mix in potassium and magnesium in your glass of water, <laughs> drink it, that solves that. But then if you continue going, people start dying at about six months. And this is of selected amino acid deficiency. That's more complex. So you have to mix some special amino acids into the glass of water. And if you do that, then people can go and start dying. If they have the weight to carry them forward, we'll start dying at about one year of pellagra and very, very, and various vitamin deficiencies that basically no one's ever even heard of anymore. All right, so a nickel's worth of multivitamins mixed in. And, and the, the product was called Optifast, and it was a superbly designed product, but it had to be used, we found, along with a recurrent support system to help people understand why they became obese originally. And so that was the program that we built. We did not teach people to eat right. You know, that's what you do when you don't know what to do. You know, get rid of this problem and send it to a dietitian. Well, <laughs> going back to my early example, you know, 
I gained 100 and, what was it, 105 or 115 pounds in the next year. Uh, overweight is overlooked and that's the way I need to be. Obviously, that's not the kind of case <laughs> that you need to send to a dietitian. So, so all of our time, and this was done in groups, the same 12 to 15 people every week, uh, meeting weekly for minimum 26 weeks, but it could be longer depending on how much weight you had to lose, helping people discover when they first began putting on weight. And why was it then? You know, why wasn't it five years earlier or 20 years later? Why then? And that's a really important starting point. Yeah. Because for many people, that was a real eye-opener. Well, I love how you're talking about making what's not conscious, conscious, bringing up from the basement yeah. into your consciousness and, and with a trusting, trusted holding space. So if you trust yes. a physician, great. If it's a psychologist or psychiatrist, okay. If it's a uh, psychotherapist, okay. If it is a, um, you know, someone who's able to work with you on holding that space with you seems almost important in terms of the invitation to disclose and share and be willing to be courageous enough to look at this as, um, as your willingness to do it. And the advantage of doing this in groups is that you soon come to realize, oh, there are other people with similar problems. How, how are they doing? What did they find helpful, et cetera? So that was really a huge step forward to have a support system there you know, week in and week out. No, that's that's beautiful. And it's also something that um, I know Tara Brock also talks about a lot and, and I think had done her doctoral research on, on that very thing. And I think that that's why, um, even though I know that there are some folks like Lance Dodes who have the contrary of view of the efficacy of 12-step programs, I know that there are um, a lot of reasons why people find them helpful for that group support in terms of at least community. Um, and, and, and well-being and resilience. Um, I know our time is winding down, but two more things to mention. One is that um, this sexual abuse piece that you mentioned early on and how connected that is to, in this case, for this study, eating disorders. Um, but also, I know that this is something that um, came up with Freud, Sigmund Freud, and I know this is something that came up, I mentioned Dick Schwartz already once with internal family systems. He was studying bulimics. Um, I'm not sure if he was tying back to sexual abuse at its origin or not. But what I would like to sort of put on the map is the prevalence of it and why it's still not discussed and how this is something that impacts people in all kinds of ways because of its very nature. It is the epitome of silence and denial. Yeah, the, the prevalence of childhood sexual abuse. Yes. Um, yeah, it's, it's a very big issue. Uh, you know, I mean, it, it took me months to accept what people were telling me when I asked. Um, yeah, you know, I, I, I remember early on thinking, well, this is the second incest case I've seen in 23 years of practice. No, it was the second incest case I recognized in 23 years of practice because nothing was set up to routinely get that information. Wow. So the question is, well, what would one do if you did, how would you handle it if you did routinely get the information? And much to our amazement, what we found was that enabling somebody to tell somebody important, some dark secret about themselves, and come out of that realizing they were still accepted, is a very profound form of doing. That asking and listening and implicitly accepting is a very powerful form of doing. Now, is that all that needs to be done? No, but it's a hell of a big step forward and it really costs next to nothing. So one of the big advances I can think of in terms of medical care in this country and costs and so forth, would be to develop a really comprehensive medical history questionnaire that would take maybe 45 minutes or an hour to fill out and put it on the internet free, allowing anyone at home to fill that out 
entering their name after they've disconnected. And if they wish, print it out. And if they wish, give it to their physicians. Now, I'm not so naive as to think their physicians are going to be pleased to get this information because they will correctly realize that simply having possession of that information has now imposed a legal responsibility on them. The experiment is whether if that were done, would at least a meaningful minority of recipient physicians ultimately see the utility of having this information standardized, in-depth, in-breadth information neatly, legibly printed out to see the utility of that and begin integrating it into what they were doing every day. I believe that's a really achievable effort. It would be a very worthwhile thing to do. Um, the other really big thing in this realm would be to figure out how to improve parenting across the nation. The biggest public health advance I can think of in current times would be to figure out how to improve parenting skills across the nation. Not selectively, but for everybody. Now you're talking, well, how are you gonna do this for 30 or 40 million young adults? Well, obviously you'd have to use either television or internet as the vehicle for transmitting this. It would probably be best to do it depicting what it looks like rather than, you know, teaching it or writing books about it and so forth. So what if one were to weave into the storyline of a soap opera illustrations of what supportive parenting looks like and how it plays out decades later, contrasting that with illustrations of what destructive parenting looks like and how it plays out decades later. I love this. So I've heard you mention it before. So you're proposing that a television network um, come up with a fictional show based on um, these kinds of findings and understandings that models very effectively uh, secure attachment parenting and all of that, and then what would end up resulting in traumatic uh, children, tra traumatized children, and, and uh, disorganized or insecure avoidant attachment, and all of the subsequent perhaps uh, compulsivities or addictions or health risks versus the sense of well being family, and sort of compare and contrast and follow them in this fictional narrative that we could watch, like. Um, Dallas or Falcon's Crest or The Affair or whatever it is, Games of Thrones, Game of Thrones or whatever it is, yeah. that we would watch it similarly, but we would look at it um, as a different kind of way to really understand uh, subcortically even ourselves what it looks like to have things be successful and not, and perhaps that would help motivate or inspire or teach through the see one, do one, teach one model, right? As opposed to just sitting there, um, like you say, reading books or, or that kind of, or shaking a finger at someone telling them what to do. Yeah. So television networks, listen, because I know <laughs> that you're listening. Um, and yeah, I think that that's really uh, an incredible way of, of, of teaching because we see the power of, frankly, reality TV, as it's called today, and this is sort of a new kind of reality TV. And then perhaps you could follow families who are doing well um, along the way in real life. In addition to that, maybe we could set up a group or something of, of, of families who could opt in to then invite them to be even filmed or something to see. Oh, it's amazing how many people are willing to share that information. I have made lengthy video interviews, videotaped with patients, I'll tell them, look, you know, you know stuff the doctors need to know. Would you be willing to talk with me on videotape about what we've just been discussing? You know, it's not going to be on NBC News tonight, but I will probably want to use little pieces of it in lectures to illustrate the point. I have never been turned down, and the closing line almost always has been, yeah, yeah, if you think it would help somebody, doctor, I'm, I'm willing to do that. It's, it's really quite extraordinary. 
Well, it's so beautiful because people are generous of spirit innately, as are you for agreeing to speak with me today. And I really have long felt that, um, you know, it's not so much um, that there's something wrong with us, but oftentimes we are impacted by um, our environment and what has happened to us positively yeah. or negatively. And our ability to move forward from that is to do just as you said, to go down, understand it, bring it up into this trusted holding space and then work on what might be wise to go forward. But in that very process, it is the beginning of real true transformational change as opposed to just symptom management, so to speak, which I think ultimately, frankly, can take a lot of time and um, may be useful sometimes, but maybe is not as effective as this really deep-rooted approach. Yes. And your study does that beautifully. <laughs> Dr. Vincent Felitti, anything else that you would like to add and share with our listeners? Any last parting words? No, I think I think we've we've covered things, you know, uh, fairly well. Just a reminder: if anyone wants further information, internet search word is ACE study. YouTube search word is ACE study. The amount of information that's there is really quite surprising. Well, I I, I really think that. Um society owes you um, a great debt of gratitude and it's certainly the work that I've been committed to transforming trauma um, and really just sort of understanding that um, there are often possibilities that we don't need to blame ourselves um, to just be stuck in and mired in our, our beliefs or keep our secrets that, that there is a way through but we won't know unless we ask the questions and that's what yeah. you've done. Yeah. Dr. Vincent Felitti, thank you so much. I appreciate it. Thanks for being here on Wise Girl, and I hope that you have a lovely Thanksgiving. Thank you. You too. Take good care.